Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Streche, and Yu Pizka as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Hello and welcome to KubeCon Europe. I'm John Furrier, Rob Stretchy, my co-host here. We've got a great guest here, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We've got multiple days at CloudNativeCon KubeCon 2023 Europe. We've got a great guest here. Cube alumni, Murley Third Umali, who's back here, formerly CEO of Portworks, now with Pure Storage. Great to see you. Uh, it's a passage, right? A passage, every, every KubeCon, you come on and give us the update. <laughs> well, there's, uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, every KubeCon, you know, has, has been something uh, exciting. Well, this time, you know, we have a lot of exciting stuff, but I'd, I'd love to kind of talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the industry and what's happening with some of our customers, uh, John and Rob. I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great time in the industry. Post-COVID, actually, there's been a lot going on. So let me kind of talk about a few trends that I think are particularly interesting. The first one is actually uh, is, is sort of the headline that forms in my head is uh, DevOps is dead, long live the platform, <laughs> right? And in fact, it, yeah. it speaks to not so much the demise of DevOps, but the success of DevOps to the point now where DevOps was a cultural phenomenon about 10 years ago, right? Uh, talking about uh, you know, developers and ops coming together and, and forming a joint alliance. But now that that has been so successful that it's resulted yeah. in kind of what we see as the emergence of platform engineering. So it's been formalized. So yeah. DevOps now has a budget, <laughs> it has a team, and it has a set of tools that is you know, called platform engineering. And essentially, the platform engineering team is there to provide a service of self-service to developers. Yeah. And the old SRE role has been kind of mitigated and is now part of infrastructure, right? It's been so successful again that now SREs are there just to perform you know, upgrades of, 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 of network compute storage and developers help themselves using the platform, which is usually a cloud-native platform, right? So platform right. engineering is usually cloud-native and it's anchored in Kubernetes and it has to do with sort of this, you know, some sort of a Kubernetes distro, yeah. some sort of a security specific to Kubernetes, and the third part is something that is data on Kubernetes. Yeah. So these are the three ingredients of platform so engineering. So I got to ask you, because we've been yeah. talking on theCUBE, Rob, yeah. Rob, you've been on many times with us on this. Platform engineering, we love, by the way, we think it's awesome. I, I'm sorry, it's Captain Obvious, right? No, I mean, it I'm is, sorry to it be is so, so obvious. It is so yeah. obvious. But it's always been that, okay, SRE, Google, kind of big iron. It's evolved, there's been a lot of debate around what DevOps is. Oh, we do DevOps, or you're the department. What's been the mainstream adoption of where it's settled in from a functional standpoint? Did Kubernetes bring that IT replacement kind of thing? Because when you look at IT infrastructure, what is platform engineering now? How would you compare it to us where, there's a lot of debates. Not everyone could be Google, so that was one. That was obvious. Yeah. Where has it standardized in the, in the minds of the enterprise? You know, it's, it's actually very, very specific and, and very clear in, in my head, right? There is kind of the old infrastructure teams, and infrastructure, there's a lot of, of on-prem infrastructure, and there's a lot of you know, cloud yeah. infrastructure, and all of that, the infrastructure itself is being cloudized, Right, it's, right. It's, uh, so that is pretty straightforward. Developers have multiplied. What's happened, what's changed is that apps have grown, and so now there's, you know, where there used to be 100 developers, there's thousands of developers. Yeah. The thing that's changed is, the, remember the old middleware, the old concept of middleware, the app server? All of that has now been replaced with this platform engineering. Platform engineering is the new middleware, right? It is now where, People can now, the difference is the old middleware was always on call and was kind of still ticketing based. Right. Now it's self-service based. So platform engineering replaced the old middleware with a self-service model for developers. Yeah. yeah, I think that what's really interesting about that is that you had a lot of developers who said, don't make me an SRE, or they didn't want to do, or that maybe they started out with junior developers in that role, and I think 
where platform engineering, to exactly what you're saying yeah. from the customers I've been talking to, is that they're really looking at that replacing IT per se, is now it's, it's become platform engineering. Yeah. And it, it becomes, and they're getting a new set of skills as well. Is that what you're seeing, is that they're yeah. trying to understand that? Absolutely, so you know, the, the, it's, it's the platform engineering group is really anchored in two types of sets of technologies, cloud native technologies, right? And the other one is modern databases, right? Yeah, and modern yeah. data services. So, Rob, the, the, the thing I'd say is the, the it's, you know, Kubernetes is really kind of three areas that we are seeing uh, are where people require more and more expertise and are uh, building part of the platform. One is the actual Kubernetes distro itself, you right. know, whether it's OpenShift or GKE or EKS and so on, Rancher uh, in, in Europe in particular. Uh, the, se the second one is security, right? Whether some specific platforms, you know, Prisma Cloud is obviously a, a good example, Sysdig uh, is a good example. And the third one is data on Kubernetes, of which Portworks is a great example, where essentially people want to manage their storage resources, backup, DR, and databases and data services underneath the auspices of Kubernetes. So that's the, uh, the kind of the, the key areas and then modern data services, which of course are, you know, things like Postgres, you know, Redis, Cassandra, Kafka, yeah. even streaming services like Spark, all of them being offered as a service by the platform team right. to the developers. Right, the, that's what we're seeing. So one of the themes in the hallways here, obviously the AI, which I'm going to get to in later, later yeah. in the interview, but is, um, which is going to be fun to hear your response to that because it's emerging and everyone's talking about it it's in the hallway. But then the hallway talk that we're hearing is the edge with Kubernetes. Maturity's here, we're seeing maturity and it's getting better. Automation's there, management's getting better. Edge is wide open. The, the Kubernetes at the edge, what's the state in your opinion? What's your view on the Kubernetes at the edge? As platform engineering teams look at the edge, it's programmable, you can put devices, you got compute storage, data yep. at the edge, AI's going to be there. Yep. What's the edge Kubernetes State of the Union current situation? I think, I think there's a lot of things about cloud native that enables the edge, right? One of them is the very concept of microservices, right? By having microservices now, everything doesn't need to be really one big heavy monolithic application. You can kind of structure them as, you know, one app can be four to five microservices and you can run different microservices at the edge versus the core depending on sort of the capability and depending on what's, what you need run at the edge. So one is microservices are you know, allowing a distributed mechanism. The second thing is just what you talked about, John, is that there are thinner things you know, that you can run a slimmer version of Kubernetes, you can run slimmer storage right. versus the core. And the third thing is the availability of high bandwidth, right? Like so 5G services now enable you to kind of run a lot more stuff at the, at the edge and then stream it back it, it, to, the, to the core. So the combination of distributed computing, lighter weight kind of uh, uh, you know, protocols, and third thing is the availability of high bandwidth is enabling this. So we're seeing a lot of our customers in the retail area. Are they actually uh, deploying? Are they kicking they're the tires? Deploying. Yeah. They're deploying. They're deploying, okay. They're, uh, and, and particularly food services. Food yeah. service vertical is one that we're seeing smart stores kind of emerge. The other one, of course, has always been, uh, one has been kind of anything that uses 5G, so distributed 5G services as well. Uh, and then the, finally, uh, the old you know, uh, IoT, it still exists, maybe, maybe less right. of a buzz now, it's the reality <laughs> of IoT. Yeah. Uh, those are the three we areas. We had Audi on earlier there, right. in the car is the ultimate edge. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think what's interesting is, there's a lot of complexity that comes with Kubernetes, and I think you, you mentioned that early on. Yeah. And I, I think, what are you seeing that you're helping customers, because one of the things, just talking to some of the people in the hall and after the, after, uh, the keynote this morning was, where do I get started, and then how do I operate it in day two? And that, that speaks to that whole yeah. platform engineering Great, thing Great well. question, see, so everybody wants platform engineering, everybody has yeah. platform engineering, but not a lot of people have a lot of Kubernetes expertise. It's a pretty tough thing. It's partly it's complex, partly it's just availability of skills, right? So what has changed now, the other trend I would say in our industry is as a service versions of all of these platforms, right? Yeah. So 
while I say platform engineering, platform engineering is available in two flavors. Typically, it's been available in the past five, 10 years as a software stack, but now it's available in an as a service stack. For example, now, Quartworks itself has offered now backup as a service. So we offer a BAS service under Kubernetes control. The other thing we're doing is to offer something called PDS, Portworx Data Services. Okay. We are offering about 11 data services that are essentially a simple one-click kind of we host the control plane, right? So all you have to do is take your containers, plug in our PDS service into yeah. it. So platform engineering, operating a platform is now as simple as collating all these yeah. services as opposed to actually kind of running them yourself. So you're saying, if I can hear you correctly, platform engineering teams yeah. are running the platforms where the Kubernetes piece is better managed because it's kind of heavy lifting that you don't really want to deal with because it's operationally impacting the engineers who are, have to come over here and work on Kubernetes. Yeah, what they're doing is, is essentially they are, are operating these as a collection of services, plug and play services. So, you know, it's no big surprise, right? Uh, again, another Captain Obvious thing, what's happening in the cloud is happening on-prem as well, right? Right. So, uh, people are taking that cloud operating model and, and trying to emulate it, and what's a good way to do it? Take your platform and turn it into a bunch of services and essentially offer pluggable uh, you know, services. So I got to ask you the question around, obviously Portworx has great success, acquired by Pure Storage yeah. in 2020, continuing the container, now Kubernetes containers, marriage made in heaven, a lot of virtualization migrating into off bare metal into cloud native. So a lot of growth opportunities yes. for sure. So good business opportunity, check, check, check. The AI impact now is upon us. In the past six months, it's been really kind of mind blowing. Everyone saw ChatGPT and they go, wow, it's horizontally. Everyone loves it because it appeals to a horizontal use cases. People, yeah, prompting, prompt engineering, prompt tuning. We see this opportunity potentially coming in and providing auto tuning, self-healing. These are topics we've been talking about in theCUBE for a decade. Now with AI, this is opportunity. What's your view, where do you see, because it's now just forming as a DevOps opportunity. Yeah. Where do you see that with Kubernetes, DevOps, security? Where's the bullseye, where's the frame? How would you frame Kubernetes and containers with an AI impact? Look, so first let me start by saying, you know, we're clearly riding the hype curve of ChatGPT <laughs> and, and GPT, so, so with, with all that being said, let's, let me actually start by saying what I think it's not, right? What I think AI is not is a replacement for a human, right? So it's not going to replace humans, at least not for, for a long time. However, what it can be is a strong aid to a human. In my, in my view, I don't think GPT or AI takes a human and turns them into a superhuman. I think that's too high a, a standard to meet. I think it turns them into an uberhuman. What does that mean? I think you can use uh, uh, ChatGPT in a couple of different ways. One of them is to supplement a human in the following way. One way that we're seeing it being used is to either confirm or deny or you know, deny a hypothesis. So if you have a hypothesis, let's say you start out say, I believe that containers are replacing uh, VMs and, and, and therefore you, know, uh, you, you don't need VM uh, any, anymore. You can use ChatGPT to kind of go out and collect data to say, can you confirm or deny this hypothesis? So one yeah. is it's a great way for you to check and test some hypothesis. The other way is if you believe and you have some information that you believe to be true, you can use ChatGPT to go collect information to help you support that hypothesis, right? So, right. but you really need to kind of, uh, there needs to be a human at the end of that to look at that data. Now the other place where I do think there's going to be huge strides in the way we are ourselves using uh, at, at Pure and Portworks is in very, very detailed vertical uh, uh, slices where you know the data to be true because it's your data. When it's right. your data and it's a very, very specific set of tightly controlled, tightly defined use cases, then you can come in and turn, uh, turn GPT uh, you know, to, to provide very, very, very specific, useful things. A great example for that is test cases, right? 
if, if you want to generate test cases for a new capability, you can point it to all of the existing tests, you know, suites that you have, BVTs, smoke yep. tests, system tests, and then it can generate, you know, ChatGPT or GPT with its APIs can generate very, very specific new test cases. And those are going to be good test cases because they're all based off of very accurate data. So it's kind of the old Gigo, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Yes. Well, yeah, here you have sort of the ability. So to me, as an aid to a human, with some human judgment being applied, and the second is in very, very specific vertical use cases is where you can use it. That's sort of my, my, my view anyway. Rob, what's your take real quick? Yeah, I, I think it's dead on with that. I think it's the, it's the quality of the data, and I yeah. think in that, it's how you have to manage that data. And I think this is where things like Portworks helps you really get there, and I think that's the, I think the critical thing that's been missing from a lot of these is how do you manage all of this data? And, and I think it seems like that, that's the route you guys are going down as well as to help them yeah. manage all of that with the things like Kafka integration and helping people get Absolutely. to those streams. Yeah, now I should point out one thing, right? Let's not forget ML ops and not just yeah. worry, you know, there's so much, there's AI and there's ML. ML, by the way, yeah. is, you know, AI without the mystery, right? right. And actually, yeah. it, it, you know, we've had Machine le le learning, you know, we have something called autopilot, which right. which learns yeah. how your your storage is, is being distributed by the application, and and we can now apply some automatic rules, learning from the machines. Yeah. So ML ops is way ahead, and it's actually much more reliable, and yeah. it's something that we've been using, you know, for a while inside of our product with with our autopilot solution. And that's what Andy Jassy said when Amazon launched. They've been using ML for years. Yeah, this is where the pivot is. As the new wave comes in, you're just going to extend out. Yeah. So final question, we're running out of time real quick, is what's going on with Portworks? How is this KubeCon going for you? What are some of the meetings you're having? Give a plug for the company and the opportunity yeah, you guys see. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, we are having a great deal of success with the emergence of platform engineering. Now there's kind of a budget, there's a center of, of, uh, in the organization where these decisions uh, uh, are being made and being driven. So with that, what we're doing is really driving a couple of things. One of them is we're providing everything as a service. Mm -hmm. Everything Portworks is now available as a service. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're offering backup as a service, we're offering Portworks data services with you know, 11 data services, so on. So that's one big theme that's happening. The other thing you know, that is happening in the industry, frankly, we're beginning to see a VM takeout uh, yeah. by containers. I, I don't know how much yeah. you're kind of seeing. They're seeing a lot of migration. Yeah. You know, over a quarter of our deployments are on bare metal, okay? Yeah. And essentially, if you think about it, right, it's very, very straightforward. Kubernetes sprays the application to the next free node with the, with the free CPU available. Right. And Portworx does the same with the storage. So, combination of something like an open ship with a Portworx is basically Portworks is like vSAN for Kubernetes, <laughs> right? And then what, what, what Kubernetes itself does is provide that virtualization. And so folks are saying, I don't need to pay a VTAX anymore. Now, you know, we're deployed in a lot of VM yeah. applications, but, but essentially with the help of KubeVirt, you don't even need yeah. to kind of stand up uh, uh, you know, a complete VMware shop. So right. there's, there's a lot an, of opportunity that customers And also, also the enablement of the apps, people want to write the modern apps, yeah. AI native. I'm really, we're going to leave it there. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank uh, you. Great thank update. You so much. Portworks, a big success story, now part of Pure Storage. Again, storage compute that's going to enable more opportunities. This is theCUBE here at KubeCon. Stay with us for more live coverage. The leader in tech coverage. We'll be right back.